Rewind the dynamite from the post wrestling site. AEW, lighting up the fuse. Sit back and enjoy the bubbly. As we hear from John and Waiting. Where we're going, we don't need roads. And if the bug stops here, this thing might blow. Everything you hear, opinions of the show. And if you don't like it, go to the forums and let them know. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rewind to Dynamite. I'm John Pollock alongside Mr. Wei Ting. Hey, John. How you doing? I'm doing I'm doing well. All right. That's it. Uh, Nothing I'm getting add? over I'm getting over an injury. I nearly sliced my finger off this week, yeah, but it's uh, it's making a rapid recovery. So that's that's good news. I saw that. What happened? Uh Cutting my finger off would be a bit bit hyperbole, but I was uh, I was cutting a bagel, <laughs> and uh, just cut right through my finger, and it was just oh, this, it, it, it it does does everyone want the the graphic details? It was uh, of course. Well, I could not get it to stop bleeding for hours. Oh it wasn't God. like it wasn't like I was in grave pain. It's a it's a cut to your finger, but it was I got it deep. I got it like enough. But the problem, the real problem is uh, typing, because once you lose, like, like your main, like, pointer finger, that's a, that's an annoying one to lose. But over the, over the years, I have developed the skill to type with other fingers. I'm not your traditional typer. I'm not using all my fingers, okay? No, I'm not you... Sean, I'm not Sean Michaels on, like, AOL, but um, I've, I've got my rhythm, and I lose that finger, it's... It's a bit annoying. So imagine me with like my two middle fingers typing. That was like my update the last two days or whatever. Yeah, for people who've never seen John type, I mean, and I don't know how many people would have, uh, other than people that that actually know him or have worked with him. But you you use the chopstick method. It's like you're playing chopsticks on the piano. Like you use two fingers to type, and yeah. it's incredible how accurate and how fast you are. Typing it's quick. The way you type. It is. I'm sure there's a more efficient way to do it, but I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't teach new tricks at this stage of the game. It's uh, it's like our our PC Apple debate. I mean, I'm too I'm too far committed to change. no. By this point, yeah, absolutely. But I mean, if it works for you, it works for you. But I think it actually helps in in your scenario because you lose one finger. I mean, one God forbid. I just you, I just I just move down the aisle. You switch. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, God forbid you 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 actually lose a finger. I think you're totally fine. You know, you have multiple chances. You have nine lives, ten lives. Well, really, eight, I guess. Eight chances. So yes. And then um, I, I was finishing up a show with Way this week, and <laughs> during the course of this show, <laughs> like this, this blood is like leaking through. So after the show, I had to go rewrap it, and my wife had like texted me or something, and I just I respond to her. I said. I had to rewrap my finger. Way too much blood. But instead of blood, I used the, the emoji for blood that gave me that option. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. I sent this text away by mistake. So you're, out, you're on my list of like people that is like, okay, it's not that embarrassing to send a text to you. I, I've mistake, done that but, with um, you. Yeah, I've done that with you. We, we've, we sent each other uh, texts that weren't meant for the other person. I think it's perfectly acceptable. I thought it was adorable. You added the emoji, the blood emoji. So sure, cool. Have you ever done that in a high profile situation, like send a text to the wrong person? Um, high profile situation. I don't know. I don't know how many high profile texting situations I I find myself in, but I I've done it. Yes, of course. It's tough. It's tough. Technology can get the best of all people. Well, on that note, uh, wait. It's been a busy couple of days. How are you holding up? I'm doing okay. Yeah, trying to you know try to fit fit these uh, afternoon recordings. Uh, all, into my regular routine and uh it's been day three it actually this this week feels like it's been moving a lot slower than usual and i don't know if that's just because like we've been doing twice as many shows or what but it's all it feels like friday honestly oh really it, i've had the opposite this week is it's like tomorrow's thursday all of a sudden i feel like this week just began um it's been very busy but i i think that i have uh I, i've liked the pace uh, uh of it there seems to be a good response to uh, what we've been doing with these daily news updates. I think it's taken I, I will say what has um alleviated uh some uh whatever the term would be prep 
for these shows at night is like putting all the news together when we're doing these shows at night. Like I'm constantly going over stuff and what's if anything has changed. And then you're watching the show at the same time. And I catch myself during these shows where it's like we don't have that that pressure of uh, having to p- cram all the news into the beginning of these shows. So, so far, so good. Yeah, I enjoy it. I mean, it, 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 it you know, for like, for instance, the mock story this uh, last night, getting it, being able to talk about it this afternoon instead of waiting tonight, mm-hmm. uh, I think provides a bit more of an immediate reaction to it. So again, uh, everybody, we have daily news updates for the entire month of November. You can check them out at youtube.com slash post wrestling, or if you'd like them directly to your phone on your favorite podcast app of choice, sign up and become a patron at post wrestling cafe.com. Yes. Um, we will have one coming out Thursday. Thursday will actually just be a solo one with me where uh, we'll go over some news items, but mainly previewing uh, the, the key storylines going into UFC 268 on Saturday night, which is a very big UFC card with uh, Michael Chandler, Justin Gaethje. Uh, that's going to open up the pay-per-view. Uh, Kamaru Usman, Colby Covington, and the one that Wei has been counting down to. It is Rose Nami Yunus and Zhang Wei Li in their rematch. From April, when Zhang Wei Li was dropped with a head kick, was it was it luck or was it skill? We will find out on Saturday. She cut her hair, right? Rose Nami Yunus uh, shaved her head a long time ago. No, yeah. I, I meant I meant Zhang Wei Li. Oh, okay, yeah, she has correct. All right, cool, awesome. You, you don't want to divulge your picks yet? Uh, you know what? I'll I'll wait till I hear your preview. Okay, good good answer. Uh, all of our work can be found at postwrestling.com. On today's news update, we were joined by Andrew Thompson, where uh, one, one one nice commenter said, this isn't just a news update. This is like a show. Well, folks, yes, it's almost like a show. Uh, so we got, to, we got to chat with Andrew, which was always fun. Yeah, as always. Uh, always great to get his takes, not just about, uh, of course, the Moxley situation, but also uh, we went pretty in-depth on the AEW title situation, which I guess was kind of solved tonight, as well, uh, NXT 2.0. From Tuesday. That's right. Uh, Brain and Davey have their latest edition of Up Next on the site. You can catch that. And Rewind Away is available for all cafe members where we chatted TLC 2011. Now, I do say this week has gone by fast. It does feel like a week since I reviewed that show with you, and it was yesterday. It, I, it's one of the unfortunate things I would say. You know, it's like Rewind Away always seems to get lost. So um, it was a show that I think we both enjoy. I mean, I don't know how much how important it felt going into it but coming out of it i felt it was a very worthwhile conversation just to look back at that particular era that uh was very much known for the same people that were on this edition of rampage or sorry dynamite (laughs) yeah and brian danielson cody rhodes and cm punk look at that very very much so yes and we we dived into the kmart effect how that impacted things at tlc 2011 Mm -hmm. so uh, you can check that out and uh going into the uh the news headlines as well from that week in 2011 including wwe taking a look at two of their fcw standouts at the house shows john moxley and seth rollins yeah yeah some really interesting conversations so i encourage everybody to check that out but also tomorrow on the british wrestling experience feed martin bushby for those of you who are fans of rev pro has a very special, very in-depth two-hour-plus interview with promoter Andy Colden talking about a variety of topics, including keeping Rep Pro alive throughout a pandemic, um, what it's like to you know be a, a, a black person in the wrestling industry, and uh, with their current relationship with New Japan Pro Wrestling. So, for the wrestling experience, if you'd check that out. That's probably going to be a very insightful interview, so uh, I look forward to that. That'll drop Thursday night on the site, so you can check out all of that. And then uh, quickly, Friday, I will be doing our quarterly call with Brandon Thurston to chat about WWE. They'll be presenting their their earnings report on Thursday at the end of business and then holding their earnings call right after that. Uh, So we'll chat on Friday with Brandon. And Friday night, uh, I I will be allowed a couple of hours of sleep as Wei and Kate from Montreal will handle Rewind to SmackDown, chatting SmackDown and Rampage. And then I'm back Saturday night with Phil Chertok to chat UFC 268, and we've got a long and winding Royal Road with WH Park and the great Jamesy on Sunday. What a what a packed couple of days. Actually, long and winding Royal Road, that show moves to Saturday. Oh man, I'm so off. S- starting this week, because on Sunday, we will have WrestleNomics debuting here, right on the post-wrestling feed 
for all of you guys who are subscribed to this right now, yeah, uh, it's a brand new era of WrestleNomics. As a part of the Post Wrestling Network, so check that out Sunday evening slash Monday morning. All right, we're going to get into Dynamite tonight from Independence, Missouri at the Cable Dahmer Arena. This is the second time that AEW has run this venue. The last time being that uh, somewhat, um, I would say, one of the better matches in Dynamite history, which was the 30-man Iron Man match between Kenny Omega and Pac back... Uh, the 30-minute. Uh, that, that was, that was back minute. in... Iron Man. Match. The 30-minute one, yes. Yeah, not 30-man. Oh, sorry. 30-minute 30, uh, uh, 30 Iron Man match. 30-man Iron Man match would be interesting. Nobody can be eliminated. All 30 men have to stay in the ring as many pinballs as possible. Yes, yes. I, I think the, the audience would be tapping after that one. Uh, you know what? Uh, somewhere some, somebody will do it. So right off the top, they mentioned the, the John Moxley situation and Excalibur noting that they are sending their support for his recovery. And this this was very interesting just to see um, how open they were about this story from last night onward, like just being, you know, very transparent about what the issue is and then bringing it up, not just here off the top. I mean, you kind of had to, given that it had already been disclosed, but um Man, we can talk a bit about it now. I was blown away by this this CM Punk speech. I, I hazard to call it a promo. It was not. It just so, sounded like a man with a very heartfelt message that was just um, incredible to hear on a pro wrestling show. I just thought it was incredible. I think it's honestly CM Punk's best trait. It's his best ability. It's his biggest talent is his ability to speak authentically to an and to be able to connect to an audience. Uh, from the moment he gets out there, this whole crowd is chanting for his name, chanting, you know, for a wrestling character. Uh, but his demeanor and then immediately, you know, his words brought it very much to a real life situation and a real life topic and something obviously, you know, he seems to uh, feel very passionately about. And uh, I don't think you can ask for a better spokesperson mm-hmm. for a company um, than than somebody like him, uh, at least in a situation like this. The show kicked off with Kenny Omega and Alan Angels, which was announced earlier in the day. And this was a, a pretty, you know, discussed match at the time when they met on the April 22nd, 2020 edition of Dynamite. And this was the match that led to Alan Angels getting hired by the company where um, Angels was got in a lot of offense in this match and it was uh, heavily discussed coming out of it. So for this one, Omega comes out. Uh, there's no Don Callis on the show. He is just with Michael Nakazawa. And Angels just is staring a hole through Kenny Omega from the corner. Like, this guy has been waiting for this moment since April of 2020 to kick the shit out of this guy. So Allens attacks him. And when Kenny takes over, the crowd is chanting, Kenny, no balls. But the V-trigger is stopped, and Angels goes for a two-count. He hits a tope suicida and a moonsault off the middle turnbuckle to the floor. And Jim Ross just adds in this line that Omega is breathing heavy. He might actually be tired. And there's a splash, and Omega gets his knees up. And Angels is able to counter and block all of Omega's offense. He's going for a tiger driver, the snap German, the one-winged angel. And every time, Angels has an answer. But then... Omega connects with the big V trigger. Angels kicks out and Shivani just yells, he's for real. But then one V trigger, two V triggers against the ropes and Omega puts him away in eight minutes. I I thought this was like a really solid television match that I I thought the commentary on top of it was great. Yeah, I I mean, I I don't know how early this match was booked in advance um, because it was not announced prior and just announced this afternoon by Tony Khan on, on Wrestling Observer Live. Uh, he did, Khan did mention, like, not wanting to announce a lot of things in advance because out of respect for the Moxley situation. Um, but I, the you know, if, if this match was put on last minute, I give them a whole lot of credit for pulling out a match from their history um, with a backstory already built in. You know, I mean, this is a person with a loose association with Hangman Page, so it feeds right into the main storyline. But just Alan Angels himself with Kenny Omega, there's so much you know, history between the two of them just from the past year. Uh, and this match for Alan Angels, you could see how important it was for the character right from the get-go. So it it was probably his most high-profile match to date, other than his first match, uh, at least as a, as a single star. And really, it was quite good. 
I don't think it hit a must see level for me like many, you know, dynamite matches have, but it was an excellent match for TV and it still feels very special seeing Kenny in a singles match on dynamite. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's further evidence of just being able to tell a story with a loss that is pretty consistent when it comes to a lot of the key outcomes that there's always, there can always be stories coming out of losses. If you go nowhere and it's just a loss is a loss, then, then that's where I think it damages people. And in many cases, it can be something that there's a redemption. There is this longer journey. There are Clearly doing that with Jungle Boy, with Adam Cole. That was certainly the outcome last week with Preston Vance, with a long-term thing with John Moxley. Um, there's there's all these little things that can be you, you don't just forget about something and move on from it. You can you can build on it and remind people of it. So you can always lean on stories like this rather than it just be a throwaway match on television for eight minutes. Yeah, and I'm sure you'll get another another iteration of this somewhere down the line. Um, I don't know if Angels will ever be Kenny Omega, but I, I feel like he'll probably get closer and closer a little bit more every time. And he wins with the one-winged Angels. Oh, very nice. Omega says that Alan Angels embarrassed him, and Omega has the power to giveth and the power to taketh away. He gets a chair, and the crowd starts chanting cowboy shit, and as he's setting up for the one-winged Angel, Adam Page comes out, and Angels pries the chair away. Omega ducks a buckshot lariat and escapes, but he leaves the title there. And Page eyes it, and he holds the title and smiles at Kenny, telling him he has 10 days as he leaves the title there on the apron. And that was our our Omega Page involvement on the show. You know, I would say this program feels maybe just kind of one big promo segment away from feeling really complete before the match. But beyond that, I I mean, they're done, you know, like this is about as high uh, of a fever pitch for Hangman Page versus Kenny Omega as I think you need to get. And they haven't even done much maybe over the past few weeks. But you have to remember, it's a story that's taken place over the course of a year plus. And so by the time that they have announced it, by the time we've gotten to this point, it's it's already there. They just have to make sure that both men are healthy, maybe cut a big, big promo ahead of time and just kind of execute the match. Um, hey, Page for sure needs the big promo sometime next week, but I'll tell you what I'm most intrigued to watch is the countdown special because ooh. this one, this one could cover the the entire hour. Um, I don't mm-hmm. think it will, but that should be phenomenal um, with all that they have to work with. How about a a, a music video set to some uh, cheesy ooh. 80s song? I think I think your suggestion would be perfect. Way you have brought <laughs> it up multiple times. I think it's time on the countdown special. Throw out that money, license it in perpetuity, and put, yeah. put Hangman on his on his horse riding to some some Rocky ballad, something. Oh, okay, sure, yes. Malachi Black feature. He is barred from ringside tonight for Cody and Andrade's match, but that won't change the outcome as he's addressing Tony Khan, who has barred him. He says that when Julius Caesar was betrayed, it wasn't just Marcus that betrayed him. Right. So alluding to. Other people who might betray Cody down the line, or maybe just referring to the other people that would come to help Andrade, if not, even though he's barred from ringside tonight. Yeah, I mean, it didn't outright state it, but I mean, it really kind of gave you this um, this theme for the, the the match between them that somebody was going to turn on Cody. Mm-hmm. And that could still be very possible. You know, uh, the Nightmare family uh, is right there. Uh, yeah, for, the, for the time being, Cody is still very much within them, but among their ranks... I think it would be a great way to, you know, push somebody outside of the Nightmare family to the next level uh, by having them turn on Cody. And somebody like a Lee Johnson would be perfect for that role. Dustin. No, I can't see Dustin turning. Brutus. Beefcake. He's in the Nightmare family? Oh, Brutus. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've got uh, maybe the Creed brothers. Uh, You know, I don't know my Roman history that well, so. Well, no, the the Creed brothers in NXT who are Julius and Brutus. Oh, okay. I didn't even know that. Yeah. I assume that's that's what they're named after. CM Punk comes out, and he wants to speak seriously as they're all chanting for him. He said there are two people that are not here tonight. One has a legitimate reason, and he wants to hear the people chant for John Moxley, and they all do. And Punk says, I'll stand here all night listening to you chant for him. 
I have a I have a bit of a history with him. We aren't the best of friends, but I received a phone call yesterday updating me on the situation, and I'm someone that knows what it feels like to keep going and going and pushing yourself to try and help others, and you get to the point where you have to get off the hamster wheel. I don't want anyone to criticize John Moxley because I'm goddamn proud of him. If anyone is here or at home, if you're in a place where you need help, Call someone, text someone. There is nothing harder, but nothing more courageous you can do. And there's times I wish I could ask for help. This was just, uh, it was just something that you are so um, untrained to hear in a, in a pro wrestling setting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in similar situations in the past, I feel like it just wouldn't really be brought up at all. Or maybe a kayfabe reason would be introduced to uh, get somebody off the of TV um, it's a very different time. And especially when it comes to topics like this, uh, the wrestling world, especially I think is, is really showing itself to be a lot more mature and, uh, a lot more understanding of, of people. You know, I think it really is quite a shift to see these characters in somebody like a John Moxley, who I think very much, you know, at least tries to embody perhaps a very traditional view of what masculinity is in his, uh, you know, in-ring aggression as a part of his character. And for that, and then for Punk here to kind of really cement him asking for help as perhaps, you know, a, a great courageous act, as as a great a, a exercise in, in, you know, showing maybe, you know, masculinity, traditional positive masculinity. Uh, I think that's wonderful. And I, I mean, he had like a tough shift here to go from something so heartfelt, so um, passionate and like really moving to the audience and something that I was really happy to hear this said on a pro wrestling show. He had to then pivot to kind of story with the second person who isn't here tonight being Eddie Kingston. And I don't like being interrupted. There's no beef that you may have conjured up in your head from our past. And some fan yells, fight him. He says, well, he's not here. I can't fight him. So then they're starting to chant full gear. And Punk says, yes, full gear is coming up. But on Friday, we're in St. Louis. And I'll await my apology. And then he explains that he was going to fill the spot in the title eliminator tournament. But he has to square this stuff up with Eddie Kingston. And the fans boo. And Punk says, don't boo. Boo Eddie Kingston. I'll see him on Friday. So Punk cannot enter this tournament until this beef with Eddie Kingston is taken care of. That was the explanation. I found it interesting that he actually brought up the matches that he could have had with Orange Cassidy and Brian Danielson here in his promo. Uh, you know, and you don't often do that in wrestling unless you want to tease those matches for down the road. And maybe they actually are. Um, and that almost seemed to be a bit of a the promise here once i get done done with kingston but i think this in this case it was maybe more so done to just put heat on kingston to I blame think that kingston. was it it's like kingston is um preventing these matches from taking place so the heat is to be on kingston though i think this needed a bit more explanation like who is what you have to get an apology from this guy to be eligible for this tournament to go in i think yeah. they could have just flat out said i mean Miro is ranked ahead. Like Miro gets in based on the rankings, which is fine. But this, the way it was laid out here, to me, it just didn't really make a whole lot of sense that you, it almost implied that I could have entered this tournament, but this thing with Eddie Kingston uh, has to be dealt with. Unless the direction going forward would be Brian versus Punk. I, I don't think he needed to really mention it. You know, I, I coming off of, I think what felt very genuine and heartfelt prior to something that, Felt very, not just storyline, but somewhat um, maybe manipulative in trying to make the audience dislike Eddie Kingston for not a very airtight explanation. Might, might have not been necessary. Miro addresses his God. He cursed and warned and threatened him. And Miro has waited patiently. And now the Redeemer is all of a sudden in the title race. And he asks God, is that you trying to help me or are you trying to toy with me? He needs God to prove himself to him. I need to prove myself to her. My road home will be paved with skulls and I will be champion. 
I will be forgiven and I will be loved. And then God, you will be forgiven. <laughs> this is the most interesting man in pro wrestling. These I, I promos th- are just, <laughs> they leave you with a lot to digest and interpret. I think these promos are so awesome. They sound great. They look great. Um, his motivation is 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 very unique. I would say for a wrestler, you know, he he went from I think uh, I guess like uh, trying to please God to now <laughs> getting God to beg for forgiveness from Miro. Like it's it's crazy, but I think it's a level of depth that like is fascinating to me for a pro wrestling story. And it's just him talking to the camera without anybody else attached to it. So uh, I don't know if I can really give you like an exact definition of what it is, but I think it sounds cool as hell to me. It's like the man is in his own personal confessional every week and Mm -hmm. has no one like he's he's shut out of his home life. He's no longer champion. He's in a corner and his God has abandoned him. He is a man without a country. Yeah, not until he wins the championship will he feel justified to go back home. Will he feel justified to accept God back into his life? Will he feel justified to accept love? (laughs) I'm just comparing to like Shinsuke Nakamura with like a pumpkin on his head and how he would deal with like losing the Intercontinental title. This is a it's a far cry from even like what he was doing with Rusev Day. You know, and, and I give him, and it's a far cry from the video game, dude. You remember that? Oh my goodness. Can't believe it's the same guy. Alex Marvez spoke with Adam Cole and the Young Bucks, and Cole says it was a fluke last week. We are not afraid of anyone. And Christian makes his return, and he's there with Luchasaurus, and it breaks into a fight out into the arena. Christian goes down, and Jungle Boy runs out with this gigantic somersault dive off the stage that just looked incredible, laying out not just Cole and the Bucks, but Brandon Cutler's in there too. This this looked spectacular. They shot it perfectly. Looked great. Totally agreed. Yeah, it kind of began a barrage of like big spots. This wasn't just your typical backstage brawl or at least, you know, um, on-ramp brawl. Like they, they had a lot of stuff in here. Yeah, Um Christian speared Matt Jackson on the stage and went for the kill switch, but is stopped with a Nick Jackson super kick. Jungle Boy sends Matt rolling down the the aisle with a, a Rana, and then Luchasaurus chokeslams Nick onto the back of Adam Cole as Jungle Boy then applies the snare trap, putting Adam Cole out, and Christian returns with two chairs and delivers a concerto to Adam Cole, which would suggest um, this is a... Two more points for the the sideline photo. Oh, okay, yes. Meaning, uh, yeah, it looks like the direction might may be as um, hinted at on Tony Khan's sheet. Singles matches between Christian and Adam Cole, and then the tag and match. The tag, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was quite the interaction here. I mean, anytime you throw Jungle Boy into the mix, like there's going to be something spectacular, and he completely delivered here. I. I thought it was like a really exciting stacking of like various spots. I will say, I understand like if you're Christian, you're probably not going to be doing too many dives to maybe compete with the Jungle Boy. And maybe that was the reason for the concerto. But to me, that one man concerto was such a protected spot in professional wrestling through its usage in the WWE that I think even just the tease would have been fine. Him actually executing it here. I mean, Cole's not going to take that any time off. He's got a match with, with uh, 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 John Silver. So uh, if he's not going to take time off, I don't think he needed to take this. I, I It's a great point. I, like, at the very least, it should be sold huge on Friday. Um, yeah, yeah, you're right. Coming back two days to do a match is... I don't think he's going to be just walking out and completely no selling it. But yeah, in theory, he should be he should be out. You even noted on commentary that Jim Ross said there's only 10 days until full gear. Almost like it was a pretty like heavy duty angle to do where you have to come back with the match so quick and even more so for the John Silver match. It's just a spot that typically is used to get somebody out like, you know, for an extended period of time. So that's all. 
Ruby Soho and Chris Statlander had a sit-down feature discussing the TBS championship. Both respect the other. Ruby says she's nervous, but she is confident about their uh, tournament match. And then FTR defending the AAA tag team titles against Samurai Del Sol, the former Kalisto, in his first match since leaving WWE. He has not wrestled since the release. And Aerostar. So, um... The match here, I, FTR, by the way, like the theme they're coming out to now, Cash is growing this unbelievable mullet that he's got on the way. I, so, I like, didn't even realize. Oh, like wow, these two man. are tr- these two are living and breathing 1984. Have they fought uh, the Varsity Blondes yet? No, I don't. It, it, one doesn't come to um, to mind, but yeah, that could that could totally work as. Uh, Whoever you want your template to be, your your Rock and Roll Express or yeah. whichever. But they just seem to be just in their element with the, this whole presentation. Um, so early on, uh, Aerostar and Samurai Del Sol hit uh, somersault uh, springboards to the floor. Uh, Aerostar is caught and then dropped onto the top rope. We went through picture in picture where Aerostar was caught and then sent down by a springboard drop kick from Del Sol. Uh, we see Darby Allen hanging out in the crowd, and Cash uh, Cash uses the uh, the gory special and ki- kicks off Dax. Uh, this is Salida uh, Salida Del Sol Samurai Del Sol kicking Dax off of the apron and rebounding to hit what was the Salida Del Sol onto Cash Wheeler. Then a diving splash by Aerostar. Dax makes the save and hits Del Sol with a brain buster on the floor. Aerostar goes for a victory roll, but it's reversed, and Cash holds on to the rope for the pin. This match was pretty crazy. This was anything but, I think, what you would have seen in the 80s, um, which is, I mean, which makes FTR, FTR so interesting. Um, they are a team... Very much uh, old school, but like mixing with uh, very modern styles. I thought it got a little little too wild at times, especially with like some of Aerostar's spots. Th- th- there was a lot of criticism of Aerostar in this match. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's it's like a big TV debut, and you can understand somebody getting very excited. But I, I also think like when, you know, within the system, you have some great high flyers who are also very tight with their maneuvers. And... This just maybe got a little bit out of hand at at, at certain times, um, but it was wild and it was a, a spectacle. Yeah, I certainly would want to see more, like especially like Samurai Del Sol. Um, I, I thought he looked pr- pretty good here, and I would love to see him um, with, with some other people on this roster. Uh, I think that he has uh, a lot to offer. Aerostar is an excellent talent. I think he just didn't have a great night, but he is he's a tremendous performer. So I, I think that you know the. Uh, th- this FTR story, I think it opens yourself up to a lot of different types of matches that they can have as well. So there was there was some spectacular stuff in here. There was also some stuff that did not work for most people. Uh, Tony Shivani finally presents the trophy to Hikaru Shida for her 50th win. But she is quickly interrupted by Nyla Rose and Vicky Guerrero and Nyla telling Shida that she's about to run into a roadblock when they face off in the second round of the tournament. And then Nyla Rose makes fun of her for how long it took her to get to 50 wins. I'd be like, and dude, where are you in the waiting line? Yeah. I beat you to the 50 wins. And then Nyla says, let's go celebrate. What are you celebrating? This promo? Um... I think she was was she was she not saying like celebrating the the expected win she was going to have like she oh, was she's going to celebrate. The win? Oh, so this is just a given that she's going I, to win this. Yeah, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. I didn't I didn't follow a lot of Nyla's logic here. That that'd be like way you. Um... Hey, let's celebrate like the Raptors winning the NBA of finals in 2022. You want to yeah. pre-celebrate right now? You want to have a. Parade. Okay, th- this is the analogy, okay? I'll make it timely, okay? This would be the equivalent of the Toronto Blue Jays telling the Atlanta Braves, <laughs> wow, you guys won the World Series in 95, and it took you 26 more years to win one? That's what it would be like for the Jays, who have won nothing during that time period. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Like, what an empty insult. Like, yeah, you're... Sorry, you guys did do some math to, well, to get that, that one, but... Is it crazy that Atlanta has only won two World Series in that stretch? Like, especially yeah. during the 90s, I always said I would rather have a team like Atlanta who they're not going to win, but they're always there. They're, they're always They're going to the contend right? pretty much every year. And I cannot speak for the entire 26 years. I'm not following that closely. But throughout the 90s, it was like they were always right there. And we did have the two World Series wins. I guess that's great to have. But I was like, I'll I'll take being close every year. They were always a great team. Yeah, it gives you some excitement. Some, you know, it's a long-term build. We won the World Series. And then, dude, we were just nothing for the rest of the 90s. No, I'd rather be an Allen Angels constantly chasing than just (laughs) not not having a title match at all. Anyway, so Nyla Rose uh, has not won 50 matches, but he's going to mock the person that did. I think the point here was, uh, the main takeaway was uh, Sheeta's leg injury still seems to be affecting her coming off of the deep match, so that'll likely play a part. Time for the inner circle, who come out, followed by American top team, led by Dan Lambert. We've got Junior Dos Santos, Andre Arlovsky, the men of the year, Paige Van Zandt, Austin Vanderford, (laughs) and that other guy. Dalton Rosta, (laughs) who got roasted here. The big dipshit chant for Lambert. And he points out that I built this team. I am American top team member number one, which was the key line. Everyone knew. I love this because from that moment, you knew exactly, exactly how this segment was ending. And it was just a trip of how we were going to get to that moment. He has the open contract that is passed down to the inner circle and Dan Lambert. He's quoting the road warriors snack on danger, dine on death. Dude, this guy's amazing. I don't want this guy to ever disappear. He is just fantastic. He was great. He's great in front of this, these audiences. Absolutely. He goes over all of the team members, uh, noting that Rosta and Vanderford are undefeated with a combined record of 16-0. and And then the inner circle is allowed to choose the members that will join Men of the Year. So Jake Hager selects Junior Dos Santos. You look like Popeye. I can't, I can't do it. Dude, this was as cringeworthy a line as we will ever get from Jake Hager. Oh my God, dude. Yeah, the inner circle, I think, have have done a pretty good job of making Jake Hager cool again. This was certainly a, a bit more Jack Swagger than a uh, Jake Hager. Holy Christ! And then uh, it's Santana who uh, I can't remember if it was Hager or Santana who uses the line, but uh, maybe it was still Hager here who noted that they are going to drop Dos Santos faster than he went down in his last fight, referencing the the Cyril Gon fight. Santana then names Andre Arlovsky. And says, you've always had rules and regulations to protect you. And tells him to bite this. And not the uh, former WWE.com show. No, he, he's referencing his uh, mouth guard with the teeth. Or the teeth, or whatever fake teeth, he, the Dracula teeth he always wears. I, I hope he doesn't bite anything with that. That would be not good. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't love these lines. I, I didn't think they had very great insults. Dude, this was, this was like right out of um, 2000. Like the, this promo, like it was, and then we went on to like the Stephanie and Jericho segment where Lambert calls out Jericho for the unsavory words he had for Paige Van Zant, And because of that, Austin Vanderford wants in the match, but Paige, who I thought was fantastic during she this She was the best of them all. She was so good. Yeah. Um, she grabs the mic. I don't need a man to fight my fights. My schedule's wide open on November 13th. And there's not an Instagram filter that's going to be able to hide the damage I do to you, Jericho. You don't have the balls, and I could take on all five of you by myself. And Jericho just lets it sit, says the joke writes itself. I mean, the crowd are already, you know. It was so spoon-fed to them. Like, all these lines that Paige was delivering was for that reaction. And Jericho says, you taking on all five of us, maybe you can put it on your OnlyFans page. Ortiz speaks, and it's translated to calling Paige a bitch. And Jericho, this is when he refers to Dustin Rosta as the other guy, but they're not picking any of them. They are choosing ATT member number one, Dan Lambert, 
who sold this <laughs> so great. All of this was contingent on him just losing his mind. I did not say that. He's having just a total fit. Um, and that, that sets up the match. I thought Dan Lambert was fantastic. I thought Paige Van Zandt was tremendous. Um, she, she was really great in this. Yeah, it, it's been fun throughout this uh, ATT feed just to kind of see all these MMA stars dip their feet into pro wrestling through in-ring action or in Paige's case, this promo and they've for the most part i think all really delivered they're totally into it Paige, i think what limited interaction she's had with any of these characters has shown a great deal of enthusiasm and cap- capability for pro wrestling so i definitely want to see more of her in this role whether it just be you know speaking as a manager or most likely eventually in ring as well so um, that was great. I thought Lambert's free cut was awesome. I thought the way they kind of built up this entire story to reveal Lambert as the surprise pick, I thought was great. Did not love the inner circles lines whatsoever. None of them, not Santana's, not Hager's and, and not Jericho's either. I mean, it's very low hanging fruit, got the crowd going. So, you know, what can I say? Like if it works, it works, but I, I wasn't, wasn't a fan. Shivani is with Matt Seidel, Dante Martin, Lee Moriarty, and Leo Rush. And Seidel congratulates Dante on their match last week. He says, everything came to fruition for you last week, and I'm okay if you want to train with Leo Rush because Lee Moriarty wants to train with me, and he challenges him to a tag match. This was like the nicest individual uh, as Dante was leaving him for Leo Rush. And Rush says that Lee Moriarty's a great wrestler, but he's not as talented as Dante. And they agree, uh, but this tag match was never announced. So maybe maybe on TV next week, it'll be used. Sure. Jamie Hayter and Anna Jay in the TBS Championship. Hayter is out with Baker and Rebel, and the winner will face Thunder Rosa in the next round. They quickly go through picture in picture. Hayter's in control until Jay comes back with a DDT and goes for the Queen Slayer. It's broken free. She goes back to applying it when Rebel distracts, and this allows Baker to grab Anna Jay's leg so that Hater is free. And then Hater just hits the lariat and pins Anna Jay. It was like very, very short. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot to this match. Certainly not at the level of the match that we saw, you know, in in our last tournament match, which was really tremendous. A big chunk taken out of picture in picture, you know. Unfortunately, so yeah, maybe not as much to be able to say about it. It was relatively straightforward i have to say but i mean it looked like these two did pretty well from what we were able to see on tv not really a match that grabbed my attention otherwise but i mean i remain a big fan of both of them especially jamie Hayter, who i, I want to see in a more lengthy match they continued the attack it's three on one so ty conti runs down and fights off all three including this kick the bit shot that she hit Britt baker with that's what it's it's called that's what i heard the bitch shot. Huh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> cool. She gets on top, and <laughs> then the others get involved, and they're about Baker's about to hit the stomp on the belt when Thunder Rosa runs down, and this certainly suggests that they will do a six-woman tag before full gear next week. Yeah, and then Rosa versus Hater in the next round, I believe. Right. Yes. yes. Jade Cargill's with Mark Sterling. They're going to watch Red Velvet and the Bunny on Friday because the winner will face her in the second round. But it doesn't matter who wins. It's going to be short and sweet, and she'll rename the belt That Bitch Show. Hold on a second. The, the, that Bitch Show, and she's going to potentially go up against somebody with the bitch shot? Um, well, Conti's not... Well, Conti could be champion by then, the other champion. Okay, so... So, um, how many... <laughs> We need to like again. I think somebody. This is, this is literally three straight segments with with the, with bitch from Ortiz's <laughs> promo, the the bitch shot and that bitch show. This was like watching NXT with their proclivity for shit. Yeah, I I, I think we will look back at this period of like freedom in being able to say bitch and shit on TV with a bit of cringe uh, in the future because it, it's like getting on like on the internet and like. You know, like getting on a, te- a message board for the first time, and you're like, oh, nobody knows who I am. I can write whatever <laughs> I want. People are just going nuts right now, saying bitch and shit, trying to cram it in everywhere. Take it easy, everybody. Oh, man. AEW is the uh, the Yahoo 
chat of 1999. Oh, AOL chat, all, all those things. MJF comes out. It's amazing. His music hits and it's instant heat as he walks out. And he addresses Darby in the crowd and says, when all of these new names started showing up, those guys in the back were sweating bullets, but not you and me, because we are part of the pillars. And without us, this company doesn't work. We're already top guys. The other two are fine, but they aren't us. And he says that we had it before Dynamite existed. The fans know who we are and what we're going to become. And that's legendary. I am a symbol of everything these people want to be, but they can't. While you, Darby, are an outcast and an incel. You're not good enough to be a normal functioning member of society. You'll never fit in. You'll never win. Myself, or or, sorry, you go from proficient wrestler to glorified stuntman, which was the line that Ric Flair famously used in his book on Mick Foley that that sparked a lot of uh, their Mm. ill will towards each other. He said that you're going to lose at full gear because I'm better and you know it. And one more thing, I'm a better wrestler. No one has beaten me clean inside of this ring. And in wrestling's history, anyone with a fraction of talent at my level on the mic can't hang in the ring, but I break that mold. I'm a great promo and a great wrestler. It's true. There's, uh, I, there's certainly, I guess. Oh yeah, some. yeah, that's true. Some. There are many people who can do both, but he he is exceptional. I mean, uh, I mean, he's very good at both of them. He was phenomenal in this segment, for one. Um, yeah. He says that he is so much better in the ring that, than Darby. He could win and beat him with a headlock takeover. Darby responds saying, I am an outcast. I'm everything you called me, but I'm not going to attack you with my skateboard. I'm going to keep my composure at full gear and have a wrestling match with you because I'm going to let my anger out tonight. And he goes towards the ring, but MJF walks out. He's going up the aisle when Sting comes out with a bat. And this wasn't shot that well, but he's followed by all these people wearing the masks that you didn't really see. Um... And anyway, the pinnacle shows up and they start brawling. Darby and Darby uh, is waiting for MJF, who gets backed up towards the ring. And then they brawl through the crowd. Darby gets raked in the eyes and thrown into the boards. Uh, but then Darby attacks him, ramming his head into the barricade. And he walks up the aisle among the fans and sprints down this aisle, clotheslines him with the most incredible force over this guardrail, and goes for a coffin drop when MJF rolls away and leaves uh, through the crowd. Now, Darby has done some insane things. We've seen this guy thrown off steps. He's fallen out of helicopters. But man, sprinting down this aisle where any one of these folks could have just stuck their foot out, I, I, I think that would be the most scary thing is that i at that speed was going to just face plant onto the cement yeah he ran like he this guy did the 100 meter dash there was no caution this man has no caution when it comes to these stunts it was really cool yeah i mean typically you might see a spot like that coming down the ramp um he chose to do it by parting the sea of of, of people and and doing it in the crowd and i thought it was spectacular it was great so, I mean, I think the program is in really good shape. It's really been led by MJF and his promos. Darby is just kind of sitting there taking it, delivering the physicality at the end. And I think it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, I think I think MJF has been terrific in this program with, with Darby. Um, I, I just think that he is functioning on such a such a high level um, throughout this, this whole program. He's been great. Andrade and Cody Rhodes. Um, it was Andrade's birthday on Wednesday. Wow. 32. That young? Yeah. Yeah. He's only 32. Amazing. They have this face off and Andrade slaps him and Cody scales to the top and gets shoved to the floor. We go through picture and picture and Andrade works over the knee. At one point, Cody goes for the double underhooks and you can see him pause and he was clearly expecting, I think, some buzz for this. It's, It's like this idea that Whenever he goes for these double underhooks, he may hit the forbidden move, but it was not there. And I don't know if like um, 
th- this crowd is really um, into this tease. Like it didn't work for me the first time, but well, there you um, go. I mean, I, but I'm not everybody. Um, some people, I think a lot of people clearly cl- clearly understood it. I, I, I guess. Um, why would the like why would the character do it? I suppose is what I'm trying to ask. Well, the idea is that if he ever were to hit that move, the pedigree, yeah, that would signal I have turned. I have gone against my word. And what does turning mean in context of of like? wrestling competition story and I mean, why does hitting the pedigree mean anything to get there i don't think it's really quite um there on the pedigree i don't see and and, and for that matter the way it's been built if he were to hit a pedigree i don't think it's getting a negative reaction Pro- no oh my god the moment he turns though he's gonna get cheered are you kidding me like that's yeah. exactly what people want he's probably a bigger heel now not doing it than he would be if he fully it, it's it's an interesting one it's one that is like you can clearly see like this is a heavily thought out character and direction but are you are you overthinking too much of this for what your audience is going to take to and that's not an insult on the audience either like you can uh just you can lose your audience by telling too complicated of a story in my opinion, yes, but I, I mean, I expressed this last week, and I thought a lot of people felt oppositely. They felt like this was, you know, the type of uh, storytelling that doesn't really insult your intelligence, that they're following along. So, I mean, in the end, you know, we judge by what the crowd reaction is, and maybe for this particular spot, it wasn't great, but I mean, in general, they're still reacting pretty big to, to Cody, and, and we're talking about him every single week. Well, and this this match was designed to get the reaction they got, which is... When Cody makes his comeback here, the crowd does start booing, and he goes for the crossroads, and it's stopped as Andrade hits the three amigos, which you had to know how the audience would react to that. So I think this was exactly what they were they wanted to elicit out of this audience, uh, getting that negative Cody reaction. Uh, the last of the three amigos sends Cody into the corner, running double knees, and then goes for a split-legged moonsault, but Cody's out of the way. He does the flip-flop and fly, and then Andrade gets a figure four, but it's reversed. So um, Cody does the, the shake, rattle, and roll, like the dusty punches, mm-hmm. and then Andrade does the figure four, and I felt like this was probably a very intentional flair versus dusty kind Certainly. of spiritual second-generation battle here in in kansas city too which is Ah. where flair beat dusty for the title there you go excellent so the uh the figure four is applied it's reversed and then uh jose the translator eats a left hand from armed anderson and out from underneath the ring are ftr and they nail cody with a belt shot he's out on the floor and drade rolls him in and hits el idolo Hammerlock DDT and pins Cody. Pinned him, yeah. I mean, pinned him with you know F- FTR um, assistance, yes. assistance, yeah. And continuing this Andrade pinnacle uh, working relationship. Yeah, yeah. Even though MJF led us to believe that it was a one-time only thing, uh, this was a surprise and a very good match. I thought crowd, I thought was engaged throughout. I thought it was a good surprising finish, and. I suppose this means uh, Andrade's continued association with FTR. Man, FTR are busy. They they have a lot going on uh, in multiple promotions. Th- did they ever explain that w- was Pac listed as barred from ringside too? I don't. I thought remember. it was just. I, I don't thought they only listed Malachi Black. I don't even remember Black being listed as as barred from ringside. He he brought that up in his promo. Right. Yeah, Pac wasn't on the show, so I don't know. No. Uh, and then FTR is holding Rhodes for a running boot, and then Arn gets into the ring and confronts Tully. And dude, this crowd, they were ready for this. Mm-hmm. Arn and Tully, let's go. In 2021, they're teasing going at it. I enjoyed the tease. I don't need to see them actually deliver this, but it was fun for the, the tease of it. Uh, because then the Lucha Bros run down, Cash pulls Dax to safety, and, of course, it's FTR and the Lucha Brothers at the pay-per-view, and that is how this segment ended. But I thought Arn and Tully was, like, the high point here. Oh, my God. Like, even if they're not going to maybe physically have a match, I mean, just seeing them act and the intensity on their faces as they're staring each other down, act, acting like they're about to, you know, deck each other. Uh, I mean, obviously, the history involved between the two is tremendous, but I think their skills just as, like, 
actors in, in the, this context is still very much there. So that that's just fun to watch. Yeah, and it, it was nice. Like they didn't draw attention to it either, even though they were in the respective corners. So it was like you had that moment where finally they're face to face, and it's like, oh my god, we have Tully and Arn here in this situation. Totally. Yeah, it was great. Uh, come back from break. It so, was a, so. What do you ha- what do you think happens there between FTR and, and Cody? Like between Arn and Tully, how do they do that? How do they get back there? You know. Like, are we presuming that, you know, FTR sticks around with this Andrade Malachi Black thing? See, it's, or was it, this a one time thing? It really did seem like they were going towards like the tag match with, with Malachi Black and Pac involved. Mm-hmm. If, if that feels big enough for the pay per view, which that's that's all that Cody has going on. So that's what I would assume is, is where things are going. Uh, but in terms of like the Arn and Tully thing, um, I, I don't know if we're really even going to pay that off or revisit it. Right, maybe just further down the line. Though Cody, Cody should have something with with FTR at the end of all of this. Yeah, he should. For the belt shot. There should be something there. Mm-hmm. John Silver was in the ring for like a really short promo just to sell the Rampage match with Adam Cole, um, which That's is still cool. on. Way like uh, concussion or not, it's uh, we've got live TV on Friday. He'll no concerto is going to stop this match. He's going to shake it off and get out there. He kept calling him Budge. Yeah, this is from being the elite. Oh, okay. And that's it. He's going to kick some budge ass this Friday. Rampage lineup is Adam Cole and Silver, Red Velvet and Bunny in the TBS tournament, and our face-to-face, CM Punk and Eddie Kingston. Looking for an apology. I I can't wait. Is this a Mark Henry face-to-face? Yeah, it must be, right? Is that really a face-to-face? That's like a screen-to-screen. Mm. You know, Mark Henry typically does the main event. I guess you could do do one for this as well. If, I, if I'm driving all the way to St. Louis, you better put me in front of the crowd. We, we, we could just shoot this thing tonight. Yeah, they really should. I mean, he advertised St. Louis. I, 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 that might be, be oh, what yeah, it I'm is. Sure, I'm sure they're going to do it in the ring. Yeah, uh, It could be a hell of a segment between these two. Mm-hmm. Uh, nothing announced for Dynamite next week. Maybe they will just wait till Friday to tee up some matches for next Wednesday. But next Wednesday, that is your last show. It's in Indianapolis for the, well, the last Dynamite before uh, the pay-per-view. Okay. Bunny and Velvet promo. Bunny will do whatever it takes. She will be the villain to win this TBS title. They also showed a lot of highlights of her landing her right hand. And Red Velvet already holds a win over the Bunny. She's going to beat her again. Brian Danielson is out for commentary. It's our main event, Miro and Orange Cassidy in the World Title Eliminator Tournament. Orange Cassidy has his ribs taped up. And Miro just starts suplexing him on the floor. Bear hug. Stomps the ribs. The tape gets removed. And Tony Schiavone says, we're going to stay with the action as long as we need to. If it cuts into the NHL, so be it. <laughs> F this I, I, hockey. It does, always, it does terrible numbers compared to us on this network. <laughs> One day I would love to see them just like go in 10 minutes into hockey. Oh, man. From Tony Schiavone going off on NHL and Pat McAfee against Major League Baseball. Wrestling has no care for their, their fellow programmers. That's it. Cassidy fights back. Shotgun dropkick, tilt-a-whirl DDT, and Danielson is right on top of it, noting the bad neck of Miro, which became the focus. Miro bailed to avoid the orange punch, so Cassidy leapt off the top and put both of them through a table at ringside and then gives the thumbs up that he's okay. Miro breaks the count at nine, and it gets hit with the beach break for the big near fall of the match. And as he's setting up for the orange punch, Miro just runs through this guy, like just shoulder tackles him in midair and then proceeds to kick his head square off go game over is applied cassidy taps the best line is danielson reacting oh my god (laughs) perfect (laughs) it was just perfect Uh, on on several levels given that it was miro um and then danielson just enters the ring for the stare down to close the show they will meet at full gear and miro will not engage in any kind of handshake uh, you, I, you vegan. <laughs> I thought this was awesome, man. Oh, the, I, this was a very fun match, and yeah. I, I thought it was the right outcome, too. Yeah, and I thought Miro was the right choice. 
You know, you have Moxley going into this tournament and going into this match with Orange Cassidy as just this incredibly dominant threat leaning towards a heel. And who knows if he would have been, you know, booed that much against Daniel Bryan. But I think the perfect person to still slot into the same role to look just as dominant and, you know, to work as a heel, straight up heel this time in a dynamic against uh, Brian Danielson, I'm sorry, is Miro. Um, you probably had a bit of a longer match here than you might have with John Moxley working his current gimmick against Orange Cassidy. Because I wonder if, like, he would have went through Cassidy quickly. It might, something tells me it probably would have been a bit longer. But this was Miro's re-debut since losing the title to Sammy Guevara. And I think he needs to look even more dominant than he has throughout that TNT run. And I thought he absolutely accomplished that. Orange Cassidy is really a perfect opponent for him to establish that because uh, Cassidy is, is a tremendous underdog baby face selling his ass off for this giant monster of a man looking to redeem him, looking for God to redeem himself to him. So the match had great urgency. It made Miro look awesome. And I think it sets up a great, very captivating match at, at uh, full gear. Yeah, this this was really interesting to see how they would handle, um, you know, su- such a drastic change to this tournament that was obviously mapped out for a while and how you handle that. Like, and it, I'm not trying to just always do the comparison, but if this had happened in WWE, you have the luxury that you could give the the audience the biggest match possible if you had an equivalent of a CM Punk available for your Danielson. I'm just using them as the examples here, but whatever your equivalents are in WWE, you can make that match. But I would venture to guess that this, that for Tony Khan, he has long range plans, medium range plans and immediate plans. And that's not to say everything is mapped out for months to come, but I'm sure he has different places of like a Danielson punk match. I am sure that has crossed his mind and there is at least a semblance of an idea of the road to eventually get there. And I'm not going to disrupt everything just for this plan. I'm also going to follow these rankings to make them be credible to get Miro in. And the end result is like, this did not feel like you were just shoehorning in a replacement. It doesn't appear like we won't, exactly know immediately if this really alters a whole lot of plans beyond Danielson and Moxley uh, in terms of Miro's direction. But I thought it was handled really well. And it's, you know, an indication of going with something while probably preserving other plans that you want to save to deliver in the proper fashion. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, an interesting question would be how he, they would have re-debuted Miro if it wasn't going to be a situation like this. I don't know if they Miro could could have could ask for a better re-debut than to be slotted in a position like this, you know, taking Moxley's place, beating Orange Cassidy, and then facing Dan, Brian Danielson. And it's going to take me a while, everybody. Facing Brian Danielson at a, at a pay-per-view. See, we kind of talked about this in the news update this afternoon with Andrew, but now that this is actually a concrete plan, uh, what's your pick? What do you, who do you think wins this match? I, I I still really like the idea of Danielson winning. And, you know, I, I, I think like there is certainly the argument of, of either one, like you're setting someone up potentially for hangman page. And I think the idea of hangman page and Miro could, could work really well that here is Miro going for the ultimate championship. Um, or it's Danielson finally getting his title shot. And that's a, that's a big match too. So I think you do have the luxury of going either way, but I, I really like the idea, especially if you are going with page of like a major television match with Danielson that would be really cementing Page into that role as champion. See, I feel like I feel like Moxley was ultimately going to win this thing. You know, Moxley would have worked really well for for that exact reason with with uh, Page. And for and for that reason, plus the fact that you know this is Miro coming off of a re debut where you're, I think, really trying to rehab him off of the, the TNT title loss and in many ways elevating him after the TNT title run. I could see him winning this one and being Page's first defense. It's possible. Like, I, I think you could make the argument either way, depending on, like, Danielson, the, like, challenging for the title is kind of this long-term thing. Like, you could do it now. You could also put it off and Miro c- could win this. I think w- had it been Moxley, you also have, I think, the the believability that either guy could win. You could see Page and Moxley. You could also see 
the Omega Moxley rematch that would time out to be pretty much a year to the day of Omega winning the title last December at the Winter is Coming one as well. Would it be exploding ring? Uh, probably not. Yeah, mm-hmm. probably not. So there you go. That was uh, that was dynamite. Um, I thought some. I, I really enjoyed the main event with Miro and Orange Cassidy. Uh, I thought the CM Punk thing was one of the best things I saw on a on a program this year. I thought it was a really important speech to have on here. And I was really glad to see that included on this show and being very transparent about it and just. And that's to Moxley as well for being willing to disclose why he was gone. He would be well within his rights to not want it public. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, You know, we've in a little over a month, it feels like seen, seen a lot of CM Punk um, talking in front of the crowd, but I thought today was felt the most like important of, of any of the speeches that he gave. So absolutely. All right, let us go to forum.postwrestling.com and see what people had to say about Dynamite. Some some mixed thoughts on this show. I think there were some things that didn't that didn't quite land and and others that did, but we will see what everyone had to say about the show. On a scale of 1 to 10, way, what was the verdict? You guys at the forum gave this show an 8.44. All right, a, a strong number here. Let's go to Muggin, who writes, CM Punk was a class act for commending John Moxley. Seeking to get help for his recovery, heartfelt as it was, he set up his um, upcoming confrontation with Eddie Kingston very well. Omega and Angels met again, and it was just as competitive as their first match. This is a rivalry to go back to down the line, and I felt that Angels was elevated from these two matches. Cage and Jurassic Express retaliating against SuperClick was effective. Uh, Cody and Andrade didn't have as many boos for Cody, which is kind of a miracle. And Miro and Cassidy was an acceptable main event. I will say that Miro Danielson is a good backup for full gear. I think stylistically they would match up pretty well. I'm rooting for Moxley on a successful recovery. I'm sure like we've had Rusev, Daniel Bryan matches, right? Rusev, Daniel Bryan. I just want to, I'm just kind of curious to see, by the way, uh, FTR and Varsity Blondes have wrestled before uh, as, um, December of 2020. So thank you, Anthony, in the chat room for that. But um, anyway, my, my my point is, even if like Rusev and Daniel Bryan had a match on SmackDown at, at some point, uh, and they did, it was a SmackDown of uh, well, 2018, somewhere in 2018. This match will be completely different. I mean, as wrestlers, they're completely different stylistically now, both of them, uh, especially Bryan Danielson. How, especially how, about that, how about that go-home promo segment of Danielson explaining that he doesn't believe in a god religion oh, religion great. is is relative <laughs> miro uh i would love that that would be wonderful if they got into a whole philosophy debate about yes. uh, religion the redeemer uh, versus the atheist that would be a great <laughs> setup yeah so whatever expectations you might have of like what a previous incarnation these two have had i i don't think it matters at all i think the match will be completely different so i'm very excited um Anyway, let's uh, go up next to Kate, who will be joining me to talk about Don- uh, Rampage and SmackDown on Friday. Kate says, it felt like there was a bit of a cloud over the show tonight, but I'm pleased that they addressed the issue with Mox and did it in a classy way. And I'm really looking forward to Danielson versus Miro, even if it's not quite as high profile appearing. I'm guessing that Britt Baker and Rebel do something to cost Thunder Rosa the, ma- the match with Hater, which would put Rosa on track for a shot at Britt at the next pay-per-view. She's better off in that mix than with the TBS title. Do you think that full gear marks the end of ATT's involvement with AEW? We were talking about this today. I don't think it has to be. I think it it should be the blow off to the program unless unless there is something down the road with, with Jorge Masvidal. But I, I don't see that, you know. Picking that's itself the, up. That's the other thing. The is Mos- Mosfet all show up? Uh, n- maybe to be in the corner, but I really don't see him being physical, especially so close to to his next fight. Yeah, I mean, he seemed to be an, a more understated part of the feud at this point. You know, like uh, earlier in this program, like he was kind of being brought up all the time as sort of the ultimate destination. But tonight was not mentioned at all. So I wonder if if that's them taking a step back or what. I, I would not – if Dan Lambert is is willing to be involved, I would not want to get rid of that guy. I think he's one of the best talkers on this show. I think there's a lot of upside if Paige Van Zandt is interested in this. Same with Junior Dos Santos. Uh, the jury's out on Andre Orlovsky. We haven't seen too much of him um, and pretty much none of Austin Vanderford or the other guy um, in the background. But, um, yeah, I, I think there's certainly some – 
potential with with several of the members that I wouldn't want to see this completely just written off uh, after the pay-per-view, even though it could just be the inner circle get their win. Um, I think you could revisit things with various members. I mean, if they aren't already, like I imagine people like Paige are, are like they're probably setting up a pro wrestling ring in, at ATT just to kind of, you know, practice and take bumps. But I'm sure JDS will continue. He's he seems like a real natural. This this to me would be a real avenue I'd be exploring for for like Paige Van Zandt and where she mm-hmm. is in her MMA career and doing bare knuckle. Like if like pro wrestling is an avenue and I wouldn't suggest this if she didn't show uh, an aptitude for the for the performance side of it. She clearly has in her last two performances. Is is King Mo sign right now? Uh, with that, he's with MLW. MLW. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, I mean, there's another potential name. Is he with ATT right now? Uh, he's he's involved with them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, am I up next? Uh, no, it's me. Let's go to Chris from Melbourne. This that honestly felt like a pretty rough episode. The production team missed a lot of action in both the Young Bucks Jungle Express and Darby MJF brawls, and the in ring seemed to be missing steps constantly in certain matches. Aerostar looked like he spent half the match almost injuring himself. Jamie Hayter and Anna Jay couldn't find a rhythm, and even the segment with the Lucha Bros and FTR seemed like a bit of a car crash. Maybe it's because backstage was all a bit rattled by the Moxley news. Highlights? I think that's I don't think that has anything to do with anything. I mean, you know, yeah, I, there, there were, I suppose, botches on the show, but for me personally, nothing that kind of ruined the enjoyment of, of the show. Like, they, you know, the, like some of the camera angles were missed, but I mean, I got the overall point of every single spot that they were trying to convey. Um, the Aerostar thing, yeah, there were a lot of bad bad botches, but I mean, it was a wild fight, you know? So I, it didn't affect my personal enjoyment. And I certainly wouldn't uh, jump to any sort of conclusions about the Moxley stuff. I'm all for Paige Van Zandt getting into wrestling, but the my schedule is wide open and I'll take on all five of you just felt like the lowest hanging fruit possible. Honestly shocked that Jericho's reply was as PG as it was. All in all, skippable, but I'm excited for the Rampage matches next week. I mean, it was designed for that reaction. It, it was what it was. I agree with Chris. I mean, I, I, again, just creatively, I think, you know, somebody like Jericho is, and I'm sure he had a hand in, like, creating the, the whole interaction, but I, I, I think he's he's a lot more capable than just going back to, you know, 1998 tricks. Let's go to Jesse from the Six, who says, Today I learned that Malachi Black is on a first name terms with Marcus Junius Brutus, ancient Roman orator, politician, and one-time assassin. As soon as Dan Lambert referred to himself as the original member of ATT, you knew where the segment was going. But I still thought he played his part perfectly. He has been tremendous in this role. I still don't really see how Paige, and especially Sky, fit with this group, and who knows what the match will look like, but Lambert has been a very beneficial addition to AEW. Question. Do you think Orlovsky will participate in the match to a significant significant degree, or, or will he just run in to do one move at the end? He is still under contract to UFC, is he not? Well, he's he's in the match, so he's obviously doing the match. I would imagine he just got through his last fight, and I would assume he's gotten the go ahead that he can go ahead and do this. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm curious to see what he looks like. You know, I, I'm not expecting the same things as, as Junior, Junior DeSantos, but I don't know if I was expecting much from GDS either, and he surprised us. So is he going through a table? Is Andre Olofsky jumping off a top rope? Uh, that's I guess that's where the bar has been placed. Last one here is Billy, who writes that uh, it was another great dynamite. I am, however, a little worried about Rampage on Friday. St. Louis fans, myself included, bought tickets to a Dynamite episode, then were supposed to have a pay-per-view the next night when the show got downgraded to Rampage. Now it's somehow a show with literally two matches. Well, you'll pro- you will get uh, dark matches and such, but yeah, that is that is what is uh, teed up for, for Friday. This was originally going to be on the eve of the pay-per-view because the pay-per-view was going to be Saturday. Right. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I, I didn't realize all, all those changes. Um, that's somewhat unfortunate, you know. But I mean, dynamites have have often been very good. Uh, but this is a dynamite only. This is a live rampage. Line. Rampage. Sorry, rampage, and it's live, right? Yes. So there's that. And, uh, I'm. I imagine they'll kind of pat the show out to to be worthwhile. But yeah, kind of unfortunate, you know, due to circumstance. All right. Well, thank you everybody for the feedback and tuning in live tonight. We are live. For our Double Double Ice Cap and Espresso members every Monday and Wednesday night. And then for all patrons Friday night after SmackDown and a live Rampage this Friday. So 
Way, you will be back on Friday night with Kate from Montreal to go through all of that. And once again, you can go check out all of our latest shows, news, everything under the sun at postwrestling.com. And you'll be back on Friday with Brandon. That is correct. Myself and Brandon Thurston, we will go through the third quarter earnings report as we get the big Nick Khan call right afterwards, a, a highlight of the quarter. Are, are you looking for any, like, um, uh, what, what are the, was it, clarity? Like, what did they call it? Are you looking for any... Uh... For some color? Color, yeah. Are you looking for any color on any topics in particular from this one? I mean, uh, th- this quarter will be, I think, heavily focused on their return to live events, which I, th- I think will paint like a pretty healthy picture. Um, not all markets have been a great success, but they- they've had a lot of, of successes, um, SummerSlam being a real big one. I am most curious during the Q&A because this is the quarter where – I think we have seen the most mainstream comparison of WWE and AEW Mm. and the month of September where AEW made significant inroads in the Northeast. They had some significant shows. You've got, um, you know, just things that communicate with, I think, that that level of analyst, things like the ad that Arthur Ashe Stadium bought in Sports Business Journal thanking AEW for coming to Arthur Ashe Stadium and selling it out. Um, that's the kind of thing that maybe we, um, don't put as much stock into, but that stuff carries weight with, with some people that are seeing that here is, you know, a company we, we follow and we monitor the stock and are seeing this rapidly ascending competitor. Um, so I, I do imagine like maybe more AEW questions and how those are answered. Like, can they still just navigate around? Everything's our competition sleep is our competition. However, we have yet to put a 30 minute commercial free, uh, SmackDown at three till three 30 in the morning to combat sleep, but we um, will for AEW on TNT. I mean, I would say, uh, sleep is a pretty regular competitor for raw for me. Um, every Monday. Ooh. So, uh, I look forward to your analysis with Brandon. I always enjoy your, your conversations and, uh, especially now that, you know, you guys might be working a bit more closer together. So, um, that'll be Friday on the free feed. All right. Check all of that out. Thanks to everybody again. Um, it's been a really great week here at the site, uh, and hopefully more to come. So look forward to uh, more shows and we'll speak with you before you know it. Goodbye.